in part three. This third section of the video, we're going to deal with the edit screens for Cubase. Uh, so far we've just recorded and uh, there's been loads of mistakes and I would like to edit these parts together. There's four main edit screens to deal with. And just to show you a brief overview, let's look at one of them. Let's uh, select a part and then in the menus we're going to pull down under edit one of these functions. We have a list, list edit screen, drum edit screen, a key and a score. Let's just look at the score one for now. And what you can see is one part, bar nine, it's the bass, it's in the bass clef, and if I play it, you can actually see the cursor line go over. And um, there's a whole lot of functions at the top here, and we're only going to deal with just a couple of them. Let's have a look at these two here. If I click on the info line, we'll see what happens. What we have now is an information line. This has loads of information that can tell us about the positions of these notes. Now, uh, we haven't got a note selected, so these are actually blank. If I should click on one of these notes, music, I know that uh, this note is a, a C on the bass clef, but what I don't know is how loud it is, how long it goes for, where it started. And that's the information we have here. We have the exact start time, which is here, bar nine, beat one, and it's actually the second beat of a of an eighth note. The length is, is 125 position markers. The pitch is C2 and the velocity is 69. The note off velocity is naught of course because it's switched off. And lastly is the MIDI channel we're on. I can change any one of these functions by clicking and changing up and down. I can change the length. I can change the position where it comes in the bar. To the top right we have a whole host of symbols here and I'm just going to use one of these for this demonstration and it's the ear. If I switch the ear on I will actually hear these notes when I click on them. Or I could use the keyboard, the left and right arrows to actually scroll through. And as I scroll through you see the actual values change at the top here, different volumes. If I should want to change the volume I can just go with the left mouse or right mouse will increase. If I want to change the pitch this is the score edit page and I'll show you one other function on this page and it's the symbols button and you can see a host of symbols that we can use to add to our score. I'm not going to get into the depths of scoring within this video but just to simply show you an example lyrics is highlighted I can just grab that and put it to underneath and if I let go of the left mouse button I get a special text input coming up and I can just type my lyrics in here and uh, tab across to do the next one and you will see when I return we have our lyrics already set up underneath our notes Let's exit this screen now. We have two ways to do that. We can either keep what we've uh, achieved or cancel. If we cancel, it will go back to before uh, before we went into the edit screen. The shortcuts on the um, keyboard is return or escape. Escape would keep it the way it was. Return will keep it. If scoring isn't your tipple, well, maybe the key edit page is. So let's go to the key edit page. What we do is select the part we want to choose and go up to edit and select key edit. This time you can see on the left hand side a piano keyboard. And just as it does in the track, this is our time base. Let's play from bar five. Once again, you can see the cursor bar moving across the screen. And as it goes across the note, it plays it. Once again, we have an info line. If I click on info, once again, we have this line across the top for the exact data of each note we're talking about. So if I click on one of these notes, you can see it tells me what bar and how long it is. And I can step through once again using the left and right arrows. This is very handy for changing pitch or the length or the velocity of any note. 
Now we talked about the toolbox on the main screen, we have a different toolbox in the edit screens. Let's have a look at the toolbox. Once again we have tools available to us. These are slightly different to the toolbox on the main screen. We still have the eraser and the pencil, but we have this compass and we have this boot forward and boot back icons and a brush. Okay, the, um, the magnifying glass is once again anything we click on will play. It's very handy to know, to actually find out what note that is. Let's have a look at another function in the toolbox. Right mouse brings up the toolbox. This is the pencil. This pencil can be used to extend in notes. I can make that note a lot longer and you can hear the difference. Or I can simply make it shorter by just clicking with the left mouse. Other functions in the toolbox. Well, we have arrays. If I have some data that I don't want to do, I can just simply just erase it like that. Remember, you always have the undo function on the keyboard. Now, the next function I'm going to show you is quite wild. It's the brush. If I want to scatter a lot of notes somewhere, this is useful for sound effects. It literally will just airbrush notes. And of course, I can erase it with the eraser as you would do with a pencil. OK, we're going to leave the other functions in the toolbox. OK, I want to show you one more function uh, on this screen, which is very useful indeed. And it's up here, it's the controllers. I click on it, and you'll see at the bottom of the screen, a new screen is opened up. For this purpose, we'll just put our hand on it and lift it up to see more data in here. Now, the idea of this is a real time letting you know what the controllers, the controllers come with every keyboard. Normally, with a standard keyboard, you get a modulator wheel and a pitch bend wheel. It's set here to pitch bend, and at the moment, there's no pitch bend to be seen on this part. But if I click with the left mouse, it brings up a whole pop up menu of functions I can look at. In this case, we want to look at perhaps the velocity. And what you can see is loads of small lines showing the velocity of these notes here. And as I click on one, you can see that it actually goes black. And as I walk through with the left and right, and using the pencil in the toolbox once again with the right hand mouse, I can actually alter these volumes. So that's very loud. And if I play, you'll see the result of that. So these are very loud. Another function in the toolbox is the compass. This is used for maybe fading in or fading out drum rolls. We'll use it, we'll just show you what it does to the bass. It actually selects all the volumes. And uh, if I use the rubber band technique to select these in dark, you actually see the volumes clearer. And if I play what's going on, you'll hear the volume slowly fade away. OK, one other function I want to show you down here is on another part. So we're re we return to the main screen. Now I'd like to show you editing on this second bass part and I can go straight to my editor this time just by simply double clicking in the part I want to edit. And there's our edit screen. Uh, here are our notes and here are the velocities. Now on this part I played a pitch bend so I'll click on here and I'll select my pitch bend. And as you can see right at the far right hand corner, I'll just scroll through a bit, a little dip of a pitch bend Let's see if we can actually hear it. OK, a little subtle, I think. So let's um, use one of the toolboxes to change it. So with the right mouse, the toolbox pops up, select the pencil. And by simply making sure that your snap is off and your quantize is off and holding down the alternate key, you can actually draw a pitch bend that you want. A little bit lower, a little bit higher. Let's hear what that does for us. <laughs> okay, the bass notes are very short. Let's uh, simply extend this bass note so you can hear what's going on. Here we go again. So you can hear it bend down and pull up again. Underneath our edit menu, we're going to look for list. Okay, this is a list of events that are going on and it 
it shows you every item of that pitch bend that I've drawn in. Let's go back to the beginning of the bass part so you can just see some of the notes. Okay, a lot of data here for you to see on this side. Here we have the actual position in bar and beat and quantize, and the length of the note, the value of the note, the volume of the note, and some other status information. It says that this is a note, and it's on MIDI channel 1. Later on, we can see, as we scroll through, by scrolling through, I can actually look at the data in a different way. I can select a part, and I can actually, with the up and down keys this time, go through one by one. You can see on the left hand side that this is a pitch bend information. It gives me my values and this is a note information. And the idea of this is a full listing of all MIDI events recorded. This is very handy if you should be recording things you didn't want to record like aftertouch. It will show up in this page here. You notice I've resized the screen now that this little arrow and if I play it from the top you'll see it actually change as the events go through. Okay, let's move to the right hand side now. This side we can see the actual event blocks lengths in time. This is the cursor bar, and if I run it backwards and forwards you can see it playing. And further right we have the velocity, and as soon as I move into that you see the pencil and I can actually change the velocity up and down of that one note. Okay, let's go on to the last edit screen in Cubase. To show the drum edit page, we would have to change this percussion track into a, a drum track. Simply click on the little note which indicates a MIDI track and the pop-up menu gives us the choice to go to drum track. And a little drum icon, a little drum track icon has come up there. Okay, next thing we have to do is create between left and right locators a part. To create a blank part you simply click on the track you're dealing with between the left and right locators. Double click. We have an empty part. There's nothing in there and I'll play it to prove it. It's empty. What we do now is double click on this part and it goes straight to the drum editor page. So we have a list down the left of the instruments and you can load different maps for different drum machines. This is the default pattern for an MT32 setup and it tells me the quantize of that note and it also tells me what note numbers on the keyboard that is. So for example, uh, here's our high bass drum and our snare and our second snare and hi-hat. Now using the toolbox in this edit screen, right mouse, a different one again, this one has a drumstick in it, I select the drumstick, let go, and there's my drumstick. I, I can actually put the values in here without even playing it from the keyboard. So with the drumsticks, simply click on the first beat of the bar. And let's click on the third beat and maybe one there, four and a half beat. This is the same, the song cursor will play through, let's play that. And I can leave it running and add other things, let's add a snare drum, let's add this one. Now the reason it's playing twice is because I have the ear mode on and it will play as I go. Let's stop it. Right, hi-hats on this line, closed hi-hat, half open hi-hat and open. Let's just add some in now, quite simple. That's on, on the beat and the half open on the half beat and then an open at the end. Let's hear this. You notice down the bottom that we have the velocities. Now we're going to select the hi-hats. And there they are, I can make them quiet or loud. Let's run it in here, loud hi-hats. Or very quiet. Remembering that this is just the closed hi-hat. If I select the half open hi-hat and take them down. The only loud part is the actual open hi-hat. Once again, you have the choice of choosing any of the controllers with this pop-up menu. Okay, in the toolbox, there's a function, these kick forward and kick back. Let's have a go at that and see what happens. If I click on one of the items, it actually moves it forward or with the other back. This is handy if you've programmed a lot of 
hi-hats and actually in the wrong way, you can quickly go over and move them like that. The different colors represent the different volumes. Uh, when I mean colors, I mean grayscale of darkness. I'll just show you a couple of other small items in this edit screen. Obviously, there's an awful lot to choose. There's, this side is muting different tracks. And maybe if I want to copy these tracks, I can once again use the rubber band technique, go over all the tracks, hold alternate down, and move it to its new position. These edit screens have multiple functions, and uh, we just want to just give you a basic overview of what they can do for you. Let's return to the main screen. Another useful function that I use all the time is to copy this part. Other than just dragging, there is a facility to actually copy, and it's under structure. It's called repeat. If I click on that, what we see here is the number of counts needed. In this case, let's do two more counts, and it gives you the option to make a ghost part or a real part. The difference between ghost and real is very simple. If I click that there, it makes a ghost copy of the original. This means that if I OK it, here's our new parts, and these are ghost parts. A ghost part means it's an exact copy of its original. And should you go into this original with the edit screen and change any part of it, these ghost parts will change as well. If this wasn't a ghost part, these would be individual parts on their own, and if any part was actually edited, it would stay independent. To finish off this first session on Cubase, I just want to show you one item under the Options menu, and it's the MIDI filter. Let's click on it. This has been the stumbling block of many sessions. As it comes default, you can see that we have two boxes here. One is the through filter and one is the record filter. This means anything played on your keyboard will be sent through to the device listening to it. And the only thing filtered out is system exclusive. My suggestion would be that we filter out other things like aftertouch and maybe program change on both. The reason for this is when you play the keyboard, the aftertouch, there's a lot of data that goes inside your computer, and if you're using an Atari 1040 with one megabyte of memory, you can soon fill up your song with data that you don't even need. This brings us to the end of our first session. And I'd like to say one thing to finish with. File compatibility. The song recorded inside an Atari can be played back inside a Macintosh or an IBM PC. Full file compatibility between platforms is a very powerful feature of Cubase. So there you have it. This concludes the first video in the series on Cubase, and I hope it's unraveled some of its mysteries and seen you through your first session. Cubase is a very powerful program and has many sides to it. Further videos will look into the other features available to you. Thanks for watching. If you require further help, there is a Steinberg helpline available 2 to 5 on weekdays. Also, you can contact Club Cubase on 081 368 2245. That's 081 368 2245. Please be aware of grey imported software. Every piece of software sold through Harman Audio is supported by the official UK software Goldsill badge.